Good morning, Frankfurt. Good morning to our guests from 13 countries. Today, Frankfurt is again one hour ahead of London. Let's make the best of it. To stay ahead of developments, you certainly made the right decision to join us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our 27th Financial Center Breakfast in cooperation with the Association of Foreign Banks in Germany. A big thank you to our partner. The UK's exit from the EU is unlikely to challenge the status of the City of London as the Europe's leading international financial center. However, Brexit does create opportunities for us as financial centers. We are in a decentralizing phase where many happy centers coexist. Amsterdam surpassed London as the largest share trading center in January, and according to the German Bundesbank, even before the end of 2020, financial institutions had moved holdings worth 675 billion euro from the United Kingdom, and those figures may increase quickly. The Bank of France governor told journalists in January that Britain's withdrawal has driven almost 2,500 shops and at least 170 billion assets to France, while Professor Wurmling from the Bundesbank has said in an interview in February that according to banks' current plans, asset relocations will eventually rise to 1.2 trillion by the end of this year. Banks have set up or expanded branches in Frankfurt and shifted something like 3,500 3, jobs so far. Competition is not necessarily a bad thing. However, will this internal competition lead to a loss of scale and eventually be a possible hindrance for a deeper EU capital market integration? Is there something like a win-win in all those quarrels? How much momentum will capital markets union gather in times of Corona? And is London's focus on FinTech eventually going to make the run in the long term? Today, we are very delighted to have Dr. Kay Swinburne. She's vice chair of financial services, KPMG UK. Her topic is competing financial center or a true capital market union, question mark. We met each other at the Eurofee panel last summer and Kay impressed her, me and her audience by her deep knowledge. Before joining KPMG, Kay has served as vice chair of the European Parliament's Influential Economics and Monetary Affairs Committee, playing a pivotal role in shaping EU and global financial services legislation, including setting up the EU supervisory bodies she was instrumental in setting the, the roadmap for capital markets union and the broader banking union files. Prior to Kay's career as member of the European Parliament, she worked in investment banking and brings a unique insight to policy behind the scene and the reality of Brexit in the aftermath of the stepping out. Dear audience, please feel free to input your questions during or after the speech in Zoom, in the F&Q part. If you want to share any comments or thoughts on our social media platform, you are most welcome to use the hashtag FMF Digital and Virtual Food for Thought. The PowerPoint slides and the recording of today's speech will be posted on Frankfurt Mind Finance website tomorrow. Okay, the stage is set and it's all yours. Thanks for coming. Good morning, everybody. And I'd like to start by thanking you, Hubertus, for the invitation and your team at Frankfurt Mind Finance for the, the delightful occasion to actually give you some food for thought at this breakfast event. So food for thought for me means I can be a little controversial. I can give you something to think about during the rest of the day. And so that topic that I'm going to address, as was just mentioned, will be whether the EU is a collective of competing financial centers, or is it really able to deliver a true capital markets union? A CMU for me sees the formation of a single capital market with the depth, breadth and liquidity to rival other global financial centers. 
That doesn't actually mean it has to be in one place, but it has to act as if it is one center. So one set of rules, one set of implementation, one set, hopefully, of things like insolvency law. So there's a lot of detail I'll go through, but hopefully we'll get to the end of this and you'll know what my conclusions are, but I'd really like to hear yours, so please use the Q&A function. So firstly, I'd like you to give, give you some context for the evolution of the EU capital markets. And as was just mentioned, undoubtedly, this is such a hot topic right now, directly as a result of the UK leading the EU and the loss of London, known to all of us as the city, as a significant EU global financial center. So London emerged as a modern day preeminent financial center for a number of reasons. And they include things like language, legal system, and the time zone. But it's also due to things like regulation, both in the 1980s in the UK and more latterly EU regulation, which came from the Financial Services Action Plan back in 1999, which sought in the first instance to create a single market for financial services. And those of you who know me well know I represented my home country of Wales in the European Parliament for a decade. And so I am actually quite proud that those discussions setting out that financial services action plan and its need were held in Cardiff, my capital city. So I hope in some way that the Welsh have played a part in developing the financial markets of Europe. So the regulatory changes in the 1980s, known to many as the Big Bang, led to London becoming an early adopter of electronic trading, moving away from the physical trading pits. And it wasn't about deregulation in my mind, it was about taking advantage of these new markets, new ways of trading, and with new players involved, opening up the markets to global participants rather than locally licensed individuals. In addition to that, there were tax advantages back in the 80s and 90s, where, especially on the fixed income instruments, relative to the then dominant US market, those tax advantages saw the emergence of London-based Eurobond markets. And if you put that together with global firms increasingly trading derivative contracts, often between regions like the US and Asia, they needed a convenient time zone and a legal basis to underpin such financial contracts. So the UK market benefited from all these things and took advantage of them. But indeed, they also benefited significantly from the cornerstone piece of the EU Financial Services Action Plan, namely MIFID the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive of 2004, the precursor of MIFIR and MIFID II that many of you will be familiar with. Central to MIFID I was the abolition of the concentration rule in which member states could require investment firms to route client orders to the national regulated markets, the stock exchanges. The plethora of new trading venues that came about, known as the MTFs and the SIs, Although an EU-wide initiative saw the majority of these new entities base themselves in London, close to their largest customers and at the heart of that global financial activity. We've now seen, however, particularly in equity trading over the last couple of months, that this trading activity in the European equity markets has started to shift away from London en masse to new EU EU. MTF entities, based largely in Amsterdam, but some in Paris and Dublin too. And ironically, the share trading obligation in MIFID II has enabled this regulatory lever to be applied to a former EU member state, the UK. Not something I foresaw when we negotiated MIFID II in the European Parliament. Now, I'm going to actually turn to a couple of slides, um, which will give you some context for all of this. So the first slide, which will come up next, there we go, will actually give you a, a feeling for where the markets are currently. And it will give you an idea before I turn to an assessment of whether the CMU devised by President Juncker and launched by a UK commissioner, Lord Hill in 2014, has indeed worked to date. 
And I'd like to run through where activity is taking place within the EU today. So if you actually look at the slide, the data comes from a combination of sources, but is actually a table formed by New Financial, a think tank based in London, but working across the EU on the capital markets. And a lot of the data comes from AFME and other trade bodies. But those of you with good enough eyesight will be able to see the specific citations on the chart. And a warning on the data, it was compiled and published by New Financial in December of last year, 2020. And an update post the January 4th movement of trading venues is due later this month. So I'd suggest you look out for that and wait for those uh, updates to come because I think there will be some significant changes. But what I'm trying to show you here is the trends, the way in which the markets are actually fragmented depending upon what the activity is. There's a large spread of the top three countries in the various financial activities occurring within the EU. And although, as you might expect, the largest market in the EU 27 in 16 out of what is coincidentally 27 categories assessed is France, with Germany the largest in eight categories coming up behind them. However, that suggests that France dominates and that Germany is a, a poor second. But when you look at the overall share of the EU capital markets activity, France have roughly 24% and Germany 21% by value. And therefore it's suggested that it's much more competitive. And that accurate portrayal is that you have at least two leading capital markets. And I'd suggest that that's actually more like four or five. Banking and private equity are dominated by France and Germany. Whereas in the debt markets, for example, securitization, Italy leads with 28% of the market, followed by France and then the Netherlands. In the corporate bonds market, France leads 38% of the issuance, with Germany and Italy trailing somewhat. And if we look at assets under management by location for the buy side members on the call today, it shows that France leads the way with 35% of the total assets, followed again by Germany and then Italy this time round. So the trading landscape has no doubt changed since January 2021. But before the share trading obligation and the derivative trading obligation has forced activity to relocate from London to the EU to service EU clients, the derivatives trading was dominated by France and secondary trading of equities by Germany, including the IPOs. That, of course, excludes London from the list. It will be interesting to see how much of the activity makes its way to other financial centres over the course of the next few years, especially as many MTFs have chosen Amsterdam as their EU base for equities. And I suspect they might move some of their derivatives trading there too. It's also a question of how much EU regulators, rather than the national competent authorities, start to dictate where trading activity happens, particularly for those large dealer brokers who have typically a subsidiary set up in one member state and then passport out to others. So the Capital Markets Union project was intended to be complete by 2019 when it was first launched. But no doubt this project has been derailed somewhat by that 2016 referendum in the UK. So the achievements to date, I would contend, are actually very modest and are not the groundbreaking changes that would genuinely see the EU move from a predominantly debt culture based on bank lending to a more balanced capital market derived funding model, and in particular, a more equity friendly approach to financing. So if we move to the next slide, which I apologize is quite busy, but I want you to look at the trends, the colors, rather than actually the detail of the words. And you'll actually see that a study conducted by the IMF back in 2019, which is when the CME project was supposed to be complete, actually assessed a number of criteria, including data available in different member states, the financial regulators and their competence and perception by the investment community. It assessed audit, tax rates and the old chestnuts of withholding taxes and insolvency practices by member state. And the green on that chart indicates a favorable perception 
the red, not so. And it suggests that some countries are attra more attractive destinations for global capital than others. So let's ignore the UK, which is that green line at the top. And let's look at the rest of them as you see the trend. There is a long way to go. But maybe as MTFs choose the location based upon potentially the CMU criteria, maybe this is why the large investment banks have chosen Germany as their subsidiary locations. We'll never really know, or indeed, we might actually eventually get to some of these disclosures to try and work out why the choice of country, why certain countries are doing better than others as people are relocating much of that business out of London. So on the next slide, again, we look at some trends in colors rather than the detail here. But the IMF asked the same respondents about various aspects of the CMU plan, what they most wanted to see delivered out of the CMU. And it seems there's clear agreement reached on supporting harmonization of insolvency laws. And second only to that was that FinTech will be the method of connecting local markets. But roughly half of those respondents agreed that a single supervisor for capital markets is desirable and slightly less want a single regulator for all capital market activities. Although surprisingly when asked, not everyone thought it should be ESMA. So I think there's quite a long way to go on that supervisory front, convincing people who the right entities are to supervise a single capital market of the future. So on the next slide, we need to now consider where the current version of the CME plan and what initiatives might deliver that single capital market for the EU, as opposed to the currently 27 competing marketplaces. And I only believe that Brexit has meant they're competing harder rather than less right now. So if you look at the left-hand part of that chart, the Green Deal post-COVID may well be the necessary stimulus, increasing cross-border visibility and utilizing more equity and other alternative funding options. I'm fairly hopeful that one of the silver linings of the economic stress of COVID may have been to persuade more Europeans to not only save, but to also invest for the longer term, becoming much more investment focused rather than savings focused. However, I firmly believe that the elephant is in the room and needs to be addressed. And that comes in that right-hand column on that chart. The Commission has tried several times to put through a package of measures that would harmonize that legislation surrounding securities. The last iteration, if my memory serves me right, was at the start of the Juncker term and called the securities law legislation. It even gained its own SLL abbreviation. However, it never saw the light of day and the co-legislators in the European Parliament never got a chance to persuade member states that this was a much needed pillar of the CMU. It was deemed too politically sensitive and so politicians in the European Parliament had to make do with securitization and prospectus changes but were not able to address the fundamentals of the single market, namely the harmonization of an solvency law only as it pertains to securities and also the harmonization of withholding taxes, which seriously affect that single market. So addressing barriers to cross-border settlement also wasn't tackled and varying consumer protection rules that prevent capital from flowing easily across the union were also put to one side. And I'd add to that the availability of a consolidated tape across the union and the ability of EU authorities to oversee cross-border post-trade activities, especially in those that manage risk, like CCPs and the ICSDs. International investors see a single supervisor and regulator in a positive way and do not appreciate the national sensitivities associated with capital markets needing to be locally overseen. So we look at the next slide. It gives you a similar picture with the AFME data. They do a similar analysis to the IMF, but on an annual basis. 
where they try and assess progress against key indicators of CMU. It's not particularly uplifting when you look at the array of colors and see how little green is on that chart. And I apologize, they're all very small, but they'll be in the packs for you to be able to access via the website, as was mentioned after this call. So what can be done? On the next slide, without an ambitious CMU implementation post COVID, which embraces the challenges of securities law legislation, I suspect that traditional factors like those shown on this slide will continue to influence the location of capital markets and their development in individual member states, which will automatically foster a competitive environment amongst the 27, rather than allowing a true CMU to emerge. The global investors that I speak to only see Europe as a single destination of choice once national competition for business becomes solely about where you interface rather than the fundamentals of the EU marketplace. So my apologies to those of you who've heard the general thrust of this argument when I was a sitting member of the ECON committee. But Professor Giovanni identified many of these barriers decades ago. The EU now needs to be motivated to deliver on them. The prize surely of a global financial center for the EU 27 is surely worth pursuing. So I'm actually really delighted to take questions. The more interactive this is, the more challenging you are, the more you know I'm actually going to enjoy it. So please um, give me a whole heap of questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank, thank you very much, Kate. That was uh, that was a heavy dose of uh, of vitamins, uh, very easily digestibly presented. Thanks so much for that, and uh, it's actually a very sobering view you're giving us here, in uh, in terms of um, of how long matters have been crystal clear and on the table. Um, uh, let me ask you about: Do you see any? recent movements that makes you a little bit more positive about it because I mean we had been everything has been overshadowed by COVID and uh, certainly during the presidency of, 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 of Germany there were the plans to further the capital markets unions do you see them completely sidelined again or do you see them just just push backwards so the disappointing thing for me was the review of the ESAs that happened at the end of the last parliament in 2019, where there was an opportunity to really try and, and put some of the, um, the some of those Giovannini barriers to, to bed, to be fair. And they were at that point um, pushed very hard by the parliament across political groups and from different member states. Whereas actually it was the council members themselves who said, no, it was not the time. And so ESMA didn't receive many of those powers. And there's an irony for me that um, ESMA now has more authority over third country CCPs than it has over national systemically important CCPs within the union, which doesn't seem to me fair. And it doesn't seem to be the right way to gain the competence and experience if you don't know what your own system is doing and you have to oversee those from other countries. So there are some anomalies in here, which to the outside world look very strange. Whereas to the EU, it obviously looks fairly sensible that national competent authorities still retain that power and that influence over important national structures. The FMIs are really important to national competent authorities and we shouldn't underestimate that pressure. But the reality is the world doesn't see it that way. And so we have to step back a little and look at how other people perceive the region. So for me, there are some, some movements. So you had an opportunity with COVID-19 emergency measures, where emergency measures for the capital market were done at the end of the year. Some of those were significant changes to MIFID II that, that went through very quickly and painlessly with very little political um, back and forth. And therefore it does give me some hope that there is an opportunity when needs must that they can do things quickly and efficiently. It's going to be interesting this year to see how what John Berrigan referred to at the Commission as the five big beasts. There are five enormous pieces of financial regulation all up for review this year. And how the co-legislators deal with those 
is going to be an important indicator as to the appetite to really progress the CMU. So MIFID II is up for significant review. That will be a, a long drawn out process, I've no doubt having sat through MIFID II and the number of years of my life that went into that. I think you've also got AFMD alongside it. You have Solvency II, which allows investment, hopefully, to be released for some of those long-term investments and will have an impact on the capital markets across Europe. And then you also have the CMU file itself and the banking union files. So there's a whole yeah, plethora of legislation that's under review. It's really an opportunity for politicians, both within council and parliament, to demonstrate their commitment to CMU and to getting that single market working better. There's no insolvency law, there's no withholding tax, none of that touches the drafts as I'm expecting them to come out, but it would be so nice to see the Commission being brave and at least putting one or two of those in to at least have the open public debate. Yeah. One can tell that uh, that your heart is pretty much still with a, with a European project. So it's good to see and very good to hear, Kay. We have, you, have, you put five beasts in the room and we do have uh, uh, the next five questions already coming in. Let me, let me raise the first one. Can you explore a little bit about location versus access-based approach to building the CMU and how open strategic autonomy may help or hinder progress? These are delightful buzzwords that have appeared in vocabulary in various documents from the Commission um, since lockdown, indeed. So I, I don't know who's been uh, putting this collection of words together to come up with new, new themes, but uh, there's a lot of them. I, I have, I guess for me, it's it put those words to one side. For me, I can see how you can have 27 countries, all of whom have got capital markets of their own, which all work as one if you harmonize the legislative framework that goes around them. So if an investor from Asia decides to invest in a basket of EU um, securities, whether that be equity or debt instruments, that they would be able to do so seamlessly and that they would be able to access the markets, they'd be able to do the trades, they'd be able to process them in a post-trade environment and be able to actually have them held in a secure, safe way that is subject to one set of insolvency proceedings if something goes wrong. That to me is not too much to ask. And then it doesn't matter if you have 27 interfaces with that system, you just have one system. If you have 27 systems, then you end up fragmenting not just the market, but the perception that investors hold of that marketplace. So it will always be a subset rather than the whole that people face into. And that for me is the fundamental problem here. So, you know, is it about strategic autonomy, all these words, these delightful sort of terms that have been put in place? Capital is global. You have to give it a reason to flow to your jurisdiction. And anything you do that for me, there's a perception of capital either being restricted in its flow or indeed being trapped when it gets there, for me is a bad thing. And therefore, if you've got other options for your capital, you would take it to the point where there are less hurdles, less barriers for you, rather than actually risking having some system whereby you might have your capital trapped when you don't want it to be trapped. And we know that crises happen and that the system needs to be able to, to cope with those crises. But you also need to make sure that when capital needs to flow out, it can, and that there's no unnecessary barriers in there, when you actually use financial stability of your region as the excuse for why you might want to trap that capital. But global capital flows need to be at the heart of this. And for me, strategic autonomy takes a back seat. That secondary, if you have good, well-regulated markets, then you will actually have a competitive marketplace people want to come to and choose to put their capital there rather than you forcing them by serving EU clients locally. Yeah. So, thanks for highlighting that perception is uh, becoming reality. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling uh, beast. Um, Kay, what about the pilot regime regulation? Do you see that as a positive step towards CMO achievement? Sorry, can you repeat that one again for me? The pilot regime regulation. Do you see that as a positive step towards CMU achievement? 
So what I'm assuming here is some of the pilot schemes that are about to take place um, with regards to some of the digital package and, and elsewhere within the system. So anything that actually gives the EU confidence to deliver the real thing is a good measure. Um, and if it's the only way they're going to do it in, in steps, smaller steps rather than one big leap, then I'm comfortable with that. If it's what it takes to get member states comfortable, then, then pilots are a way to go. But if there is a specific piece of legislation I've missed that is called the pilot regime, then I apologize to anybody <laughs> on this call right now. So I, I wait for some comments and sarcastic comments to come in the box. Yeah, no, I would, I, would make, I, I would make the bet that's not, that's not the case. Okay, a little bit more uh, on, on the relative level playing field between professional and retail investors. In view of recent developments, do you see any initiatives to look into that space, like creating a level playing field between professional and retail investors? So this is always a, a very, very tricky one. And, and we spent many months talking about the differences between retail investors and wholesale investors and whether or not under MIFID II, they should have one system or whether we should have a different regime for retail versus wholesale investors. And overall, it was decided that we should have one system that could accommodate both sets of investors. But they are very, very different and they're very different in their needs and requirements too. And so when you have a wholesale market, and in particular at the time, obviously when we were talking about MIFID II, London was part, very much part of that market. So the wholesale markets in London are very, very different to the retail markets in Sweden. And so you needed different levels of protection for consumers, the retail consumers, to what you needed for the professional investors. You also needed different levels of disclosure in order to actually keep costs down so that retail investors could get the information they needed to make their investment decisions without having to purchase hugely expensive data. So there are all sorts of things in there that ultimately retail is very different to wholesale. And I would still suggest that on balance for me, separating out, being brave enough to have retail market rules and then have separate retail rules is a good thing. If you're trying to service global corporates, it is a very different set of systems and the professional nature of those investors to your, your retail investors doing putting their savings into their life policy to give them an investment plan for their futures. And I'm still not convinced that you can merge those two things together. So leveling the playing field for me causes me concern because in EU terminology, that would mean that you have to impose the same levels of rules to protect the professional investor as you do the retail investor. And that therefore is, is not for me suitable. You do not need to put a, a retail, a, 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 a professional investor through the same hurdles as you'd expect the protection of those serving the retail market. But the reality for me is you do need to have some of the benefits, the cost benefits, that the wholesale market have in terms of the cost of trading versus the retail markets. And it is very expensive in most EU member states for the retail investor to trade. And those I think can be dealt with potentially in different ways. They could be dealt with through the, the competition route rather than being dealt with through the markets uh, legislation route. And I think the national competent authorities might play a much more active role, role here given that consumer protection is a national agenda rather than an EU competence. So I do think that in the retail space, there's a lot more that the national competent authorities could be doing to actually ensure that their retail investors get a better deal, rather than putting it in the primary legislation that effectively raises the bar for professional investors and raises the costs for them. The next question is a little bit more philosophical and philosophical. So sorry, and um, I, I would like to remind the audience at that occasion that you were also a member of the Khalifa report, and probably you can answer it a little bit with respect because I suppose the 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 question is raised a little bit with technology in the back of the mind. It talks about the necessary conditions of CMU success is delegation to the brightest minds wherever they are located the right way to make the CMU success? 
So I'm actually really excited about the future digital capital markets, where for me, if we get the digital capital markets right, if we make them work properly, and we enable all of those technology innovators to really let loose, as it were, within you know, a regulated environment, for me, there's huge hope that location becomes secondary, that you end up having technology which can be global, Technology, which means your, your investors can be protected wherever in the globe they are. Your records will be accessible for those that the Commission have anywhere in the world. You can have real-time settlement rather than T plus two, which, you know, we thought T plus two was a huge achievement when I was the rapporteur for CFDR. Why can't we do T plus zero? Why can't we take all of that risk out of the system? Why can't we do, you know, real-time margin calls um, calculated in a digital way on all clearing so that we don't have intraday margin calls that potentially weaken the system and cause instability during periods of peak volatility. For me, the goal of the digital capital markets is to really get those efficiencies to make sure the capital minute by minute is where it needs to be and keeps the stability as well as the efficiency in the marketplace. I think that's a huge target. It's, it's one that every region in the world should want to be at the forefront of. They should want to be able to make it easier for that innovation to happen. And they should want to change the legislative framework to allow that innovation to be tested and to see how much we can move and how quickly we can move to that new world. And, you know, the Khalifa review for me was a, a real opportunity to spend the last eight months going and talking to all of these current technology providers, large, small, fintechs versus techs, the banks incumbents versus the newbies. I mean, talking to them across the piece. And they're all excited because there's huge opportunities to really drive this forwards. And for me, you know, the, the chancellor in the UK referred to the fintech wave as being Big Bang 2.0. And for me, that's taking what I mentioned in my opening remarks about embracing the electronification of the markets in the 80s rather than those physical pits where people yell and scream at one another, to actually now going to the next stage of actually saying, okay, markets are going digital. You no longer need a physical presence in every part of, of you know, the EU in order to be present here. You can have your technology that actually allows you to do that and serve all your clients equally. That for me is an exciting prize. And the EU's done, in my mind, a really great job with the package, the digital package that was put out in the summer. I enjoyed reading it, whoever put that together and constructed it and got the thread to go between all of the six reports did a really great job. And I genuinely think that any region in the world wanting to actually really move quite quickly could take the best of that package as has been drafted, the competitive parts, I might add, I don't like the protectionist parts, but if you take the competitive parts, and actually implement that quickly, I think we'd end up with a really great system globally for that fintech to emerge and to develop. So I'm excited. It's probably the one thing that I, you know, can leave all the Brexit doom and gloom behind with and actually look forwards to how, you know, not just the UK, but globally, we embrace that digital future capital market. But the technology has been there for quite a while. We just have to get comfortable that we can actually move. Very encouraging, very exciting. Thanks, Kate, for that. And not surprisingly, the, the next question around that topic comes from Sweden. And um, the, the question here, does technology eventually not even lead to the fact that we might have less concentrated financial centers, that it's much more widely scattered all over the place and uh, there is no such thing as the future of a financial center itself? So I think that's very likely to be true. So I think there are for all sorts of reasons, but it, it depends very much for me on the way in which we now either go to a new way of working post COVID, where suddenly decentralized work in general is an accepted modus operandi for a large number of people in the population. Because psychologically, if communities decide that a decentralized work environment is the new normal, then I think it's a smaller step to take to think of decentralized financial services. There will always be a need to have trading floors in one location where you can monitor the compliance, that you can actually check 
that you know the the culture and and behaviors of those who have the ability to potentially do wrong in the system are actually closely monitored it may be that there's technology in the future that can monitor that in people's homes but it will be intrusive and i'm not so sure and uh, certainly under EU uh, human rights and data protection and, and civil rights, that's necessarily going to be a route people will want, where every keystroke on your computer and every phone call you make you know, within your home is going to be recorded. I suspect that that's a step way too far for Europe. So I think trading floors will exist for quite some time, but most other functions, you will find, I think, that if we, if we don't regress to business as usual and we find a new way of working, I think culturally we may move quicker towards this decentralized you know, servicing model. If that's the case, then you know it's not about each member state having a decentralized system as the questioner suggests. It really is about you know, having a platform that works as far and wide as possible and that you, know, you can access that system wherever you are in the world and you can actually participate fully in those markets. That's a bit of a nirvana. But I would hope that people have that as a vision somewhere in the system in the Commission. Excellent. A, po a positive nirvana to, to, to look forward to. Okay, a completely different uh, space in which the next question moves. We're talking about the recovery fund. Uh, would the fact that the recovery fund is not only huge, but needs to raise capital, help foster capital market integration? I think it goes a long way towards those, well, it goes a long way to the first step. So, you know, government issues or quasi government issues in this case are actually only part of your capital markets. What you really need in Europe right now you know, is to actually get your savers turning into investors. So if I could take the serving, savings culture of, for example, Germany, And, and give it a little bit of the Swedish investment culture and risk appetite, you would actually power the capital markets union project because you'd suddenly have a huge amount of domestic capital released into the system. And you know, how do you actually give the savers in many conservative cultures the, the confidence to take a bit more risk? And I've been surprised at the low interest rate environment The prolonged low interest rate environment hasn't persuaded much more of a shift towards that increased risk culture. So I don't know what we need to do, but we need a massive education process to try and persuade people that, you know, to save a, a decent pot for their future, they are going to have to put some of their savings at risk in the investments that they make in order to actually get that to function. So, yeah, there's, there, there's scope. A lot of scope. I think it's a first step. It gets people more comfortable, but it's it's not it's not the answer. answer. But I probably have a little bit of, of of encouraging news for you on that front because it's almost three million Germans and uh, female and male uh, moving into the space and starting directly trading with stocks, three million, um, just over the last nine to 12 months. So that's a significant shift of culture. And they, they, they're the young uh, because they obviously have understood that there is no way to save yourself out of, uh, out of the situation with, uh, with, with, with pension schemes. Uh, saving no longer does the trick. So capital markets have to be it. Um, okay, that's 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 an interesting space. What, as you as you rightly criticize the Germans to be a little bit too cautious on that on that end, how would you advise uh, Germany? And I'm not saying regulators, government, or whatever. I'm I'm very general, consciously very general in the term. How would you advise a country like Germany to to really get going on capital markets? So I think it starts very young. So, uh, I mean, I have children who are currently at university and I'd like all those university students to actually understand how a pension accrues. How do you actually accrue enough money to keep you in your old age? It would be a really great set of, of, of lessons for them to, to learn early on. And uh, fortunately for me, my son has already decided he's interested in the capital markets and has spent some time doing some research on investments and how to do it. My daughter, however, this is the classic, I have no idea how my, I've managed to get the classic old fashioned 
stereotypes for my my kids, but my daughter has no interest at this point in time in her future and, and the way in which the, the markets work. So hopefully um, in a, a few months time, she might also have decided now that she has her own investment product um, for her university fees to pay off, I'm hoping that that will now persuade her that she will also look at the risk that she might want to take. And I've made sure that I don't do it for them so that they actually, you know, with the money that's in there for their university fees in an account that they are actually now taking charge of their own investments. Because if they don't start in their late teens, then it gets much more difficult to get that risk culture as you get older. And I know myself, you know, as you get older, you get much more risk averse. So I think, you know, you need to start young. So it's great news. You have 3 million new investors, you know, in the capital markets, because once they start, provided they're not burned in the volatility that, you know, we're seeing at this point, then, then they will actually hopefully be there for the long term and, and appreciate that they can then have a future, uh, you know, in terms of, of the money that they require to keep themselves in the lifestyle that they want. So it's school and it's, it's universities. And in particular, I think universities could do with, with doing a lot more of, of that education so that people really understand what it means. I will bring that message forward. Okay, okay. As we as we are reaching the the end, one one question back going back to the Khalifa report. I know there is a lot of a uh, lot of your heart, a lot of your passion in it. Um, do you see in that report also the early signs of bridging between the EU and the UK on a joint policy towards? those technological breakthrough. It's a global market and, um, and Europe is not in, in the leading position here. So we'll probably have to bundle forces and we probably have to get our act together to make sure that more of, more of those fintech companies in future will come out of Europe, either the UK or the Union. Um, is, is there part of that report addressing that issue or would you say the union should should make sure it's uh, it's going to stand on its own so i think fintech is is one of those areas where the whole world is competing rather than collaborating at this point in time because they see the size of the price i mean this is a huge market um you know it, it's billions of of euros worth of a market, it's worth going after. And so, you know, the UK is in, in a fairly strong position. It has one of the highest levels of inward investment for fintechs. It it's, has no issue with startup funding. It, it has a very, very strong startup culture. But what we found in that review was that it has an issue with scale up. So scaling up those firms, once they get past that initial phase of becoming authorized entities in the financial world, they struggle. And so how do you assist them at that stage? And I was responsible for the policy and regulation chapter of the Khalifa Review, um, given my background. And, you know, one of the things we found was that the regulators could do more. So yes, they have a sandbox, which is world renowned. Everybody, there are now 50 countries around the world that have copied the sandbox. So it's obviously a good idea that's working. So that sandbox needs to be developed further. We've given them some ideas on how they could do that. It needs to be more accessible. At the moment, it's only for innovators. So if you're the first, you get to use it rather than if you're the better second or third. So, you know, there's a lot of room for expanding the scope of that sandbox. But also regulators in the UK need, in my opinion, to assist that scaling up, to assist the growth journey that those firms go on. So holding their hand a little more through the regulatory um, path. It's not that they need less regulation, it's that they need some assistance facing into it. As we all know, if you face into MIFID II, it's a monster piece of regulation. And many of these firms don't have full compliance teams or full legal teams in-house. Therefore, they need some assistance on how to face into this. Even some of the payments firms who are growing rapidly and their business models are adapting as they go, if they were in much more closer contact with their regulators, who have authorized them, they would actually, I think, have a smoother journey and less blips along the way. So there are things that we suggest for scaling up that can be done. We need an investment fund in the UK that actually helps that, that scale up. Um, we have seed capital, we have a, a, a dearth then of, of companies that can then actually scale up. So we need to have that 
typically they'll go to the States, they'll go somewhere else, they'll find another way of raising that big round of capital later on. So the UK isn't looking to Europe necessarily as the competitor, they're looking outwards to the rest of the world. And in this instance, the US is, is the biggest threat on the basis that they've got the most advanced capital market. It's the attractiveness of that that will bring many of the fintech firms when they get to be unicorns and take them away. So it's, it's how do you encourage them to stay when they become that size? We've got a lot of European companies who are based in London, who are headquartered there, who are regulated there, who are regulated there because they thought they had access to the EU single market. And to be fair, I have not in all the hundreds of firms that we interviewed during the course of that review, I haven't spoken to a single one of those fintech firms who didn't say they had concerns about losing access to the EU market. And so I think it would be in everyone's interest that when you've got a technological solution that assists consumers, or you've got a technological you know, answer that helps society you know, with the unbanked, why would you want to prevent them from actually bringing that technology to assist as many people as you possibly can? So I would hope that we'll be able to have bridges, even yeah, you know, there is no equivalence in the fintech world. So you, you, we need some form of a fintech bridge between the EU and the UK going forwards. And I'd hope we get to the stage that those relationships get to be mature enough that we end up not seeing each other as, as just competitors, that we see it as a, a symbiotic relationship. And that, you know, there's an awful lot to be gained by working together in order to free up capital for both the EU and the UK firms and to actually give them a bigger platform to advance to compete against the rest of the world, which is ultimately where all of this is. It's the rest of the world versus us as a continent. And the UK may have left the EU, but I keep having to stress, we have not left the continent. We have not gone anywhere else. The island is not drifting. <laughs> so, so Kate, thank you so much. It's been delightful. It's been most nutritious. Uh, very, very happy and very glad that you spend your time with this morning's Food for Thought. Great to have you here and hopefully in a not too distant future we may come back to you and, uh, and, and ask for an update. Ladies and gentlemen, that was today's Food for Thought. The next Food for Thought will be on April 22nd. Dr. King Ao, the Executive Director of the Hong Kong Financial Services Development Council will share his insights of the development and the role of Greater Bay Area. As we just learned from Kay, it's very important for financial services to have the global outlook and understand what's happening in the world. So I'm pretty sure and looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much again, Kay. Take care. Have a good day. <laughs>